This is the WOW Signal Podcast, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. departure from episodes that are specifically concerned with astronomy, astrobiology and so forth. This episode is about an artificial life simulation called Noble 8, created by today's guest Tom Bubbly, who has been developing it since 1996. The aim of this podcast is to give Tom the opportunity to speak directly to some of those in the astronomy community as he believes that Noble 8 could play a role in future space exploration, whereby discrete types of hardware would be able to communicate with each other in the common language, in this case Noble 8, that would connect all the elements, allowing them to cooperate with each other and collaborate on tasks without the need for human intervention. I imagine this might involve projects such as multiple robotic missions to other planets or moons, asteroids and comets, where various tasks such as mining, construction or modification would require different types of machinery or robots to perform tasks dedicated towards common goals. And they would be a they would need to be able to solve problems and obstacles as they encounter them by mutual planning and execution. Uh, Tom will describe himself and his work in much greater detail during the upcoming conversation. Uh, but before we start, here's a brief description of Noble 8, which I've read directly from the dedicated webpage. Noble 8 includes a detailed biological environment for the Noble 8 to live amongst and a cognitive simulation for the Noble 8 survival. From this, multiple additional simulations have been added to the development, including a weather simulation, a social simulation, a narrative simulation that governs both external brackets speech and internal brackets thought narrative for the mobile apes and also various physiological simulations to cover metabolism, diseases and other physiological elements. The simulation is intended as a palette for open source cross-platform development on Windows, Mac, iOS and Linux. ApeScript The simulation includes a detailed scripting language for user-implemented movement and cognitive process development. ApeScript now comes standard with the simulation. So without further ado, let's hear from Tom Bubbly. So for the uh, Wow Signal podcast listeners, would you like to um, briefly introduce yourself? So my name is Tom Barbele. I'm originally from Australia. When I was about 19 in 1996, I started developing a simulation called Noble Ape. And mm-hmm. the purpose of Noble Ape was to both simulate a very rich environment that uh, entities, in this case the Noble Apes, could wander over, but also simulate the noble apes' cognitive processes. And I did this primarily as a kind of instigatory dare um, Mm. in order to see whether you could simulate a variety of kind of deep philosophical models of the mind within computer simulation. And through this process, I've layered a series of different kinds of simulations, both associated with the biology, the weather, you know, the, the landforms, these kind of things on the right. external simulation, and also uh, a rich language model, a reactive simulation model, uh, a social simulation model, 
uh, and kind of integrated all these aspects of kind of, well, the reactive simulation is fundamentally a, a kind of neurochemistry simulation, I guess you could call it. So all yeah. these aspects have come together in Noble Ape, which you can think of really as a simulation clearinghouse. Because mm -hmm. when one simulation works in a way where it's either no longer needed or it fulfills the role of another simulation, then I just kind of neatly combine the two. But mm -hmm. rather than, historically, I didn't use other people's simulation methods. I was more interested in exploring, um, you know, ways of modeling different things myself through first principles and some background in physics and mathematics. Mm -hmm. But more recently, a roboticist by the name of Bob Mottram in the UK contributed about three years worth of work. He drew from a number of existing theorists, in particular the work of Cynthia Brazil at MIT associated with social robotics, um, some of the early Core War um, language evolution, um, you know, algorithms, uh, things like Tierra, although the implementation in Noble Ape is relatively unique. So, you know, Noble Ape continues to this day. I have a variety of projects I'm working on currently. One of the chapters, well, the chapter I'm working on currently is associated with how the Noble Ape simulation can be used to solve murder crimes which wow. is an interesting juxtaposition of ideas. But it's the notion that when you get to trial associated with murder, you are typically presented as a member of the jury to mm. kind of narratives associated with what has occurred. But actually, through simulations like Noble Eight, there's a multiplicity of solutions, and you can get through a relatively simple principle called random walk, the probability of a variety of situations occurring. And you get a different notion of surety through this, but I think also it provides an interesting example of how... I mean, Noble Ape is relatively unique in terms of its approach, but how these advanced simulations can develop plausible uh, and humanly plausible uh, examples of what may have occurred in a, any given, you know, parameterized circumstance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is an interesting mode of analysis. I mean, when I started developing No Blade, it was very much associated with, was this thing even possible? Mm -hmm. And now nearly 20 years into it, it's not only possible, it's considerably more advanced than what the common narrative is associated with where you know, where artificial intelligence or where science is in these kind of areas. Right. I've intentionally returned to developing Noble Ape rather than going out and actively promoting it. I went through a period of time where I appeared on BBC Radio 4, amongst other places, and did active promotion for Noble Ape. But I think I found more, my time is more rewardingly spent um, actually working on the simulation as a whole and working on a lot of really interesting problems. Not all of them are associated with external, you know, abstract entity simulation. A lot of them uh, relate actually to how computing has changed dramatically over the past 15 years. Of course, yeah. Multi-core processes, network computing, now what, uh, what I call atomic computing, which is, I guess, represented in some regard in reactive programming, but enables you to have these vast distributed systems, like, for example, you know, Netflix or Amazon or these kind of things. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of it is actually working within relatively abstract ideas of, of computing to try and get more processing power into the mm -hmm. simulation environment so I can do more eight brain cycles per second, which is the metric. But sure. I'm interested in talking with you today because I I was going to give a presentation, mm -hmm. uh, I think, earlier this year at the SETI Institute associated with putting Noble Ape into space. Right. And I thought, based on the, the format of the podcast that we're recording for, mm -hmm. there may be something of interest for the kind of broader listenership associated with my thinking along those lines. So I, mm -hmm. I thought that might be an interesting topic to, to frame here. Uh, yes, uh, that sounds uh, like a great uh, lead into the next part, I guess, yeah. Um, did you get in touch with SETI, or have you had much interaction so, with them? SETI has, I think for more than 20 years now, has had a conference called CONTACT. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of CONTACT is to put folks such as myself in front of a microphone. I mean, there are a wide variety of folks that speak at CONTACT, and many of them are people in industry that still have a solid interest in 
not only space exploration, but the possibilities. So there's a combination of kind of futurists, astrobiologists, a wide variety of tech folk um, that talk. It used to be an annual conference. It's now a biannual conference. Mm. However, unfortunately, having planned to come and speak at Contact, I'm really looking forward to the possibility of presenting some of these ideas. My wife had to have her tonsils out rather rapidly. Oh. Mm. Um, and as is the you know medical establishment in this country, it's a lot easier to look after a spouse in these circumstances. So I was basically in the hospital giving her nursing, you know, n doing right. what traditional nurses might have done. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, and the contact conference was, I think, two days after that surgery. And mm. I had basically been up for 48 hours and unfortunately had to cancel um, that talking. But I thought this would be an ideal opportunity to present at least some of that information to your listeners. Yep, okay, well, um, just go ahead, Tom, and... So... <laughs> Have at it. Have at it. <laughs> so the problem that I think Noble Ape solves in space is the problem of the weight of intelligence. So historically, space exploration, and here I'm talking about lunar landing primarily, required humans on board craft that were kind of forced up in jet fuel, what have you. And still the weight of intelligence or the requirements now, particularly associated with remotely... Uh, you know, driven vehicles and these kind of things is still a, a part of space exploration that seems to cause the majority of faults. So, you know, when landers, you know, crash into Mars or these kind of things because they've someone back on Earth has miscalculated a trajectory, these are the kind of heavy intelligence problems that, uh, you know, still seem to plague space exploration. So. And in parallel to this, um, well, you know, through the mid-90s through to today, I've been looking at these problems of intelligence, in particular with regards to computation. Now, although we've talked about, you know, using vast computer networks for Noble Ape, it also scales very well down onto, um, you know, microprocessors, microcontrollers sure. in some cases. Mm -hmm. So this gives an ability to have um, an evolving reprogrammable intelligence, for want of a better term, parameterized intelligence, that can then travel on hardware that can technically become outdated in a time frame of 10, 15, even 20 years. Sure. One of the interesting things about Noble Ape when I started was I was um, living in a converted shed in Canberra, Australia. Wow. I basically missed meals in order to get an internet connection. Um, I was a university student, but I was a university student with very limited means. I also actually worked at a, um, the local uh, physics, research physics institution, okay. um, which paid my bills and you know put me through mm -hmm. university. But at the same time, um, you know, the rent was particularly expensive, food was expensive, and it didn't really leave me a lot of kind of creature comfort luxuries. One of the things that I skimped on where I couldn't skimp on internet was computational power. And I developed a lot of the early, well, the simulations leading into Noble Ape as well, with computers that were typically 10 to 15 years old. Um, I'm talking you know, 286, 60, 80,000, you know. Prehistory. The, those generation computers that were really kind of cutting edge in the mid-80s, and I was in the mid-90s yeah. when I was developing Noble Ape. And through this period, um, I developed Noble Ape to be very um, small, both in terms of memory footprint, but also in terms of code base. And the, although it's true to this day, but it was very true then. There was a lot of recycled code in terms of, you know, multi, multi-purpose coding, basically. Mm -hmm. So I proposed, or I wrote up for this SETI talk at least, that the ability to have architecture independent software that could communicate easily between others of these modules. Mm -hmm. And also, the main problem that NASA has had historically, and when we're talking space exploration, unfortunately, I'm, I'm relatively NASA-centric, um, has been a loss of information. So mm -hmm. if you look at the original you know, lunar lander, what have you, mm -hmm. all that stuff is lost. I spent a small period of time working with University of Houston and their kind of NASA outreach group in, I guess, the late 90s. And I was absolutely stunned with, firstly, the amount of money they had, 
mm-hmm. but also how the money was being used in infrastructure, like you know, rooms packed with the most expensive computers they could buy. Sure. But the software and the intelligence between the software was lost, you know, through these upgrades because the software wasn't really designed to be, you know, upgradable through the paths of these computers. So flash forward probably to the mid 2000s and um, amongst other things, I edit a site called Biota, which is a kind of collective of similar simulators that have a diverse perspective on, on a variety of these simulation problems. The founder of Biota is a fellow by the name of Bruce Damer, who's worked for NASA for about the past 15 years. And he has slowly tried to engage the kind of NASA establishment associated with open source. Thankfully, because I've been doing Noble Ape independently, I've maintained it open source for nearly 20 years now. Which means throughout this process, particularly, and I should also point out for your listeners, I should have done this in the initial introduction, (laughs) Noble Ape was used by Apple from 2003 to about 2009. Mm -hmm. And Apple used Noble Ape as a means of um, refining some of their processor techniques, but also showing third-party developers how they could write optimized code, particularly associated with real-time graphics, but also associated with just, you know, type mathematics, basically. And then in 2005, Noble Ape was, um, because Apple changed their hardware architecture to be all uh, Intel-based, uh, in 2005, Intel started using Noble Ape as well. Mm. Uh, and there was a group of about 20 Intel engineers that used Noble Ape through this period too. This moved me very much into the kind of atomic processing model. Mm-hmm. So I've all, I mean, one, of the, one of the early tenets of Noble Ape was to make sure that it was open source so that everyone could see it, but also as I've noted, I have a history of owning not only old computers, but not really guaranteeing even in a year's time. I mean, I, I, I now live in, you know, a certain degree of middle-class surety, probably upper middle-class surety, but through the early development of Noble 8, that was never there. And I never assumed that the computer that I was using to write or work on Noble 8 with would be the computer that I would use it on in two, three weeks time. Mm-hmm. And I kept the software, I mean, the reason Apple picked up Noble Ape actually was because it would compile on the three different compilers for the Mac platform. And at that time, it would also compile on different Linux compilers and also different Windows compilers. And I made sure that Noble Ape was compiler agnostic as possible. What this means from a space exploration perspective is it doesn't matter what hardware you're working on currently because Noble Ape should be able to run in the hardware that you will have in three, five, you know, ten years' time. And that's a central tenant to the development as well. So through this, you have a core, a technical core, that has a lot of kind of basic computer-related stuff associated with I.O., memory management, um, you know, writing files, these kind of things. But above that has a series of simulations that are removable as well. They're almost like um, you know, building blocks that you can add and remove okay. various problems. Mm-hmm. So in the case of social robotics, for example, Cynthia Brazil's research uh, at MIT, uh, Noble Ape has the social robotics components. In fact, the social robotics components are the easiest ones to remove because a lot of the other simulations cover the social robotics components and do it in a slightly more elegant and interesting way. So if you have a series of these devices that exist in a a lander or a rover or the kinds of ways that we've used to explore space or something that's flying or potentially landing on an asteroid, you immediately have a translation of compatibility and interaction which breeds robustness, which is the the phenomenon that you really want here. And um, I've not... I mean, I've not explored Noble Ape explicitly associated with space exploration, but it seems like all these components that have gone into the development of Noble Ape would be very useful for this technical purpose. And the problem, the notion of reinventing the wheel and building a better wheel and all this kind of stuff it haunts every aspect of, of software development. But I think based on a historical legacy and also continuous development, continuous ongoing development. Noble Ape has components that I think would be very useful for this. And in particular, 
because it continues to develop and continues to adapt and add other simulation aspects and refines over this period of time, it's something that I think is, you know, interesting and potentially useful uh, for space exploration and the kinds of problems that confront, you know, <coughs> the typically um, government-funded industries that do this stuff currently, but maybe in future private industries as well. Well, private industries does seem to be playing a, a bigger part, um, certainly with SpaceX and uh, projects like that, I guess. Yeah. Their funding is still very small compared to the um, government-funded areas, though. I mean, I think the interesting thing, particularly when you look at things like NASA, is just um, how how many people, for how long, with the salaries and the equipment and all these things that NASA has gone on. And when I came to this country, when I came to the US, I had a very, I don't know, um, idealistic, I guess, mm -hmm. view associated with the moon landing. And how amazing it was that humans, through whatever means, in this case probably Cold War rhetoric more than anything else, <laughs> were able to put humans on, you know, the moon. It was quite yeah. extraordinary. But when I spent time with Americans, and these are just everyday Americans and folks talking about it, the wonder associated with that was heavily tarnished with the fact that this organ this group, this thing, mm. this, you know, NASA, yeah. had continued on um, through a series of expensive and spectacular failures. And when I spent time at University of Houston, and when I saw, um, literally, it was it was it appeared to be a schoolhouse. I mean, that was it was a large high school like building that they were roomed up in. I'm not sure whether it was a high school or not. the The nature of American architecture is the people that designed high schools also designed, you know, public buildings for you know, things like universities and NASA and stuff like that. Anyway, you'd go into one of these rooms that would typically hold, I guess, about 40 students, like a large classroom size. And it would be packed with maybe not the latest, but maybe last year's highest end, in this case, Silicon Graphics computer. Mm. There would be about, I don't know, $4 million worth of technology Whoa. in this <laughs> one room just gathering yeah. dust. God. And this might have been the heyday of NASA, particularly associated with the funding, but I was at the time, you know, working on the, the smallest, oldest computing I could find, so, and it always amazed me that there was just this kind of disconnect of expenditure versus what I saw as being productivity. The stuff that I've seen through SpaceX, and this, I've had a kind of competing narrative associated with prizes, mm -hmm. and the notion of whether prizes actually cultivate good solutions or whether they just cultivate winners that may not be able to follow through uh, in certain circumstances. I'm very interested in collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I think collaborative development is an amazing model to get things done relatively efficiently. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm always a little bit concerned about prizes, but I certainly follow, you know, SpaceX et al. Mm -hmm. um, in this line. I think the... Uh I was going to say, uh, the element of competition uh, seems to be like a modern day thing. It's based on how cheaply can you propose, uh, make a proposal and get mm. out. But it, and as you said, these things don't uh, always uh, get followed through or work or whatever. And uh, NASA was uh, it's one of these uh, primary American iconic uh, institutions, I guess, and uh, I'm not sure how after the moon landings they then uh, presented themselves to the American public in a way that engaged them. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Or? Well, I mean, I think the space shuttle. My my wife was my contemporary in terms of age, but she lived mm. in the US through you know her, her life, mm. uh, and she remembers quite fondly um, prior to Challenger, obviously. Mm. The students gathering together and learning about the astronauts and all these kind of things. I mean, I think NASA had a pretty good... There was some... I mean, Apollo 13, as it exists in popular consciousness in a Tom Hanks movie, yep. illustrates that the American public was waning by the time of Apollo 13, mm. associated with how important, you know, putting people into space is. Mm. But I think the, um, the space shuttle program, certainly through the 
uh, early 80s, cultivated, I mean, just in terms of children in schools watching this stuff, which they weren't doing for Apollo 13, uh, gave a, a new sense of optimism. And obviously Challenger did considerable damage to that. Um, but, I mean, these things are amazingly dangerous. It's just phenomenal that humans can actually do this stuff anyway. And it's I, incredible. Yeah, yeah. That, that danger is always um, always there, and just sometimes you're reminded about the danger, uh, you know, in these and, kind of well, tragedies. Because when it does go wrong, everyone sees the very spectacular results of the, uh, well, disaster, basically, and I think um, they, they lost the second um, shuttle, didn't they, in... Uh, in 2002 was it so it was a few years back yeah. the second one came back and then they um they quit that <clears throat> and did that uh, well i suppose you wouldn't know but so uh, presumably that would have freed up uh, quite a lot of uh, nasa bad, uh, budget to well unfortunately into... unfortunately nasa i think is part of i mean it's part of the same <clears throat> funnel that you know it's a defense funnel basically right. and um I'm not sure if that actually is the case, but I do get the sense that it is part of that. And obviously the US has been doing other things with regards to defence spending over this yeah. period of time too. I think NASA's budget has basically dried up. I don't really get the sense that, uh, you know, that it's fun being associated with NASA that much anymore. Um, and yeah, I, I don't really know. I don't really get a sense of, of, of NASA in an everyday thing. My ex my experience at NASA was very brief, and I wasn't actually at NASA. I was at University of Houston working with them, um, but attached to a NASA facility through that, and obviously anecdotally through my friend Bruce Tamer. Um, but I think the, the NASA program actually came from... I mean, I'm always interested in hobbyists. I'm um, always interested in the potential of hobbyists actually... To, and this, in large part, comes through reading Darwin and Pigeon Fancy related stuff, and all this good stuff. And I think, you know, the hobbyists have an interesting role to play, potentially, after... And, I mean, NASA, you know, Von Braun, all this stuff came from hobbyist um, roots. And I think you have a problem where you have these expensive, overarching infrastructural things that don't yield results in a set time frame, mm. but you'll still have, and I guess this is your listenership, <laughs> a hardcore group of hobbyists that are just absolutely obsessed. And within sure. that group, you may actually, so part of the, part of the contact conference is a fellow who works at uh, Pixar <laughs> and he is a, I'm going to say that again for the benefit of your editing person sure. afterwards, because there was a large bang as I said Pixar. Okay. <laughs> One of the fellows who talks at the contact conference is actually an executive at Pixar, but he is an amateur astronomer. Right. And through amateur astronomy, I think uh, you have a perspective where they are now producing, at least in terms of photo imagery, mm. better quality content, or at least comparable quality content, to, you know, what is being done uh, within uh, institutions. So you have all these interesting ebbs and flows, particularly associated with technology. Now, propulsion technology is still, you know, relatively expensive from my understanding. But I think there are interesting possibilities as solar and a wide variety of technologies become cheaper. I'm waiting to see uh, electronically flown solar glider and although, obviously, at certain layers, that would not be ideal to get as high as possible. Uh, but that at least could get, get you to a height which typically, you know, with hobbyist jet fuel technology, you can't get that high. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there are a lot of interesting ways of thinking about this problem going forward, um, particularly. But then again, you have this notion of, um, what would you call it, orbital junk. Yeah. And you don't really want the hobbyists adding to the orbital junk. In fact, really, we need to start thinking about how we deal with orbital junk um, in very productive terms. But, yeah, I think there's a lot still there for uh, hobbyists to get interested in, and certainly, I mean, that's why at this contact conference I was going to float Noble Ape as a technology, mm -hmm. because I thought that at least... and. I think probably your listenership is far greater than the contact conference in terms of reach. 
but you know you have in, you have minds particularly young minds that are coming to this and have infinite cycles in terms of processing power that they can utilize against these kind of problems sure. so yeah it's always good to put these ideas out there yeah fair enough fair enough um right so where have we got to uh, so the contact conference is that something you would uh, try and get to in the future or uh, do you think that chance has gone for the, uh, uh, no sure. i mean i don't think I, I unfortunately medical emergencies happen uh, yeah, of course. and you know when you have to nurse a, a spouse it kind of <laughs> gives a little bit more street cred to the medical emergency <laughs> so Fair i don't enough. think i've been excluded or blacklisted from the contact mm -hmm. conference okay. i found it interesting i mean i I treat these things with a certain degree of scepticism. I've been to, I could probably count on just two hands the number of conferences that I've been to. And I always feel, or I typically feel dirty going to these conferences because I'm always frustrated by how slow, I guess, um, a lot of these fields develop. Um, there's a lot of conservatism in academia, sure. yeah. which I think is just very frustrating if you've been independent, freed from this and able to develop in a variety of different directions. I also submit, or historically I will continue, I guess, through a trickle, to mm -hmm. submit um, academic papers and chapters for publication. I have no problem with peer review. In fact, Noble Ape has periodically gone through these peer review uh, journals and what have you to be published. Uh, okay. I enjoy doing that on some level. I don't find it particularly productive because I'm actually just putting these little, you know, grains of sand into pools that are not in the same, I mean, they're not doing the same. The nature of the problems that academics are facing is associated with tenure funding and publication. The nature of the problems that I'm facing is associated with, you know, actually substantial step increments and complexity, which yep. unfortunately, particularly computational biology, but a large, large sway of what you hopefully consider artificial intelligence and kind of, you know, bottom up AI and these kind of things is still, you know, complexity is still problematic within academia. So all that is removed from the problems that I face, which is largely time related, but also I think the problems of modern computing are very real and need to be explored, particularly, I mean, if you're writing, if you're writing game of life algorithms 30 years ago, mm. you don't have a means of scaling that unless you've done some interesting research from then until now. And I think a lot of these academic communities don't see processing as being their primary challenge where I see processing as being the primary challenge because yeah. it enables me to do whatever I want once I've gotten over you know once I've actually gotten the raw power out of the, the system <clears throat> yep. so yes I would go back to contact contact is one of the few conferences that I've attended that's kept me interested primarily because it has a very diverse um, f group that it draws from but also it has um, it has a children's component to it in parallel. They have a children's challenge that they run every couple of years uh, where they have a group of children who, I think, and, and, and some adults, I probably should point out, that yes. solve uh, space exploration problems. Oh, so right. they set them a problem and they go away in little groups and they mm -hmm. all have you know big bits of paper and colored pens. Mm -hmm. And then periodically through the conference, there's kind of 15 minutes, half an hour, and the, the kids come back and you know, demonstrate what they've done. Oh, right, okay. That's a so, good way. Yeah, there's all this kind of... I mean, it's interesting because it's, it's, it's a bit kind of crazy hippie in terms, of its, <laughs> in terms of its origins and also many of its contributors, but I actually quite like that. It's refreshing, you know, because there's well, no, also... Yeah, sorry, continue. It, well, it's also important, I think, to uh, engage people like children. Certainly, like, uh, yeah. Uh, and all this claims from authority stuff, which is one of the most curious things that you get through these through more traditional conferences, mm -hmm. is quickly eliminated when you have a bunch of kids coming and speculating associated with the different body types of aliens that may be encountered. I mean, so yeah, I, I, I like that aspect of contact. Good, good. Um, so, is there anything else you want to continue saying about um, No Belief for the time being, or would you like to... Um, Talk about some um, space matters, for example. Um, do you well? Obviously, you're familiar with things like the Fermi paradox and the Drake equation. Certainly. Do you have uh, Do you have a philosophical overview about um, wh whether we um, are conducting well? Is SETI a 
a oh, worthwhile thing to do. No, that's an and... interesting. That's an interesting. So, having wandered around City, mm. well, there are a series of interesting points here. So, mm. I'm let's let's deal with Earth for a second. Let's I start with it. Okay, let me just blow my nose. On the no okay, all done. <laughs> Thanks. Let's start with Earth here. So, yeah. I I'm probably unique in this way, but I like to think that I've brought a few people along for the ride. One of my wrapping points is this notion of the technical singularity, where machine intelligence will uh, be greater than human intelligence. Uh, so uh, Ray Kurt, Kurtzweil, basically. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I'm post-singular, which means that I state quite explicitly that machines <laughs> are more intelligent than humans now. Oh, okay. And I come to this through a series of derivations, but it all hinges on the work of a paleobiologist called Roy Plotnick. And I talked with Roy Plotnick about eight years ago now. I stayed with him a couple of years ago and spent a a few days chatting with him. But Mm -hmm. his idea is that, uh, well, it's not his idea, actually. It's a relatively fundamental idea um, that paleobiology seems to be coming through currently, Mm -hmm. that um, survival is the best metric for intelligence. And all this kind of... You know, humans are at the top of a long chain of organisms and all this kind of nonsense mm-hmm. doesn't really describe what intelligence is in a practical fashion. Right. So through this, you can create a number of quite interesting derivations which show that machine intelligence is something which is considerably greater than any metric that you want to float through this analysis mm. of human intelligence. And the interesting problem that comes up then is how do you translate this to BBC Radio 4? Mm. How do you come on and how do you actually make this sound remotely rational because obviously you're a nut from the (laughs) get-go. And the way that I um, frame it is that humans are so totally obsessed with their own neurotic brain chemistry and the creations within (laughs) that that they have, like, they've um, held intelligence hostage within this framing, where by it's the, the description I use, which may illustrate this for your listeners very well, mm-hmm. is two horses are looking out over a highway. Mm-hmm. And they say, sure, those cars are fast, but they'll never quite be horses. <laughs> we have never tried to make car, well, some have, and they've failed spectacularly. Mm. But the notion that you can have a car and you can have a horse, and most people choose to go with cars currently, or buses or trains, yep. or, versus horses, is the same kind of problem that we have with this notion of intelligence, that we are caught up in this idea that intelligence has to be horses, but at the same time we have... Cars isn't even really a good metaphor. We have these vehicles that travel extraordinarily quickly. Rockets may be a better metaphor. Jet planes mm-hmm. may be a better mm-hmm. metaphor. Sure. And we're still pointing at those things and saying, yes, they're moving fast, but they're not horses. Right, okay. <laughs> so with this analysis of intelligence, it, which I framed within the anthropomorphic divide, which is this whole notion of humans being, you know, mm-hmm. a div- there's a division of intelligence between us and everything else because we're so yeah. damn smart. Mm-hmm. You start to explore questions of how how we frame a number of questions mm-hmm. within our own bodies, physical forms, what have you. The likelihood of entities existing outside our solar system that look anything like us is relatively small. Yeah. But we always construct this notion that they'll somewhat be humanoid, you know. And I think the potential... So when I, when I did astrophysics as, as an honours level physics course, mm-hmm. um, the academic who presented said, there are solar systems that we can now observe that do not appear to adhere to physics as we are able to describe other solar systems with. Uh, yeah. And the conclusion from that could be that there is an intelligence that is able to manipulate those solar systems. Or modify them, yes. Or modify yep. them. Yep, yep. And that left me thinking. Now, 
I would have thought uh, Occam's razor might apply a little bit easier, just that the physics we know currently is crap. We've mm. kind of invested a vast quantity of time in stuff that describes things local to us, but not particularly far away. I thought that might be a slightly closer thing. But if we were to explore this notion of uh, intelligently manipulated um, galaxies, mm-hmm. the forms in which these intelligences would take could be any form. I'm, I'm a big fan of Freeman Dyson's cloud of gas, but there are a wide variety of other possibilities in there. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to be very critical associated... And, you know, Hollywood's a great thing. So Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but we need to be very <laughs> no, we critical. we love it. We love it. <laughs> <laughs> we need to be very critical associated mm-hmm. with every um, perceptive way that we would want to draw intelligence being just like us. Uh, yes, I've heard, I think it was someone called Simon Conway Morris, <laughs> who is, a, um, I'm not sure of his exact profession, but uh, he, his idea was that uh, with convergent evolution, uh, we could maybe give our, use ourselves as a proxy by saying that like two eyes facing forward are very handy for seeing what's around you. Uh, it's very handy to have hands and a, a posable thumb, for example, to physically manipulate things in your immediate environment. Um, but he does say also that he'd be very surprised if uh, there's anything like us uh, anywhere. And I think that's partly because of the very circuitous routes uh, which human evolution has taken. Uh, uh, we've had uh, five major extinctions on this planet. And, uh, you know, we're at the, you know, what, what we're supposed to be the pinnacle of that evolution. And other people say, well, no, that's just our perception. But, um, uh, what's so uh, Freeman Dyson's uh, cloud theory about? So as you mentioned just now. So, <clears throat> well, that's a very good question. It's okay. always good to ask me pointed questions associated <laughs> with things that I've said. No, I haven't heard it before. Is, I, yeah. Now, my understanding is that he, <clears throat> and again, I think it might be part of his robot chicken writing, but I'm probably terribly wrong here. Right. Uh, <laughs> he he postulated that I think the continued evolution of human intelligence would move towards a cloud of gas. I think that oh. was the way he framed it. Again, mm-hmm. this is from his writing in the 70s, mid-70s, right. I would say. So mm-hmm. it's around the robot chicken time. Would that be influenced by Solaris at all, do you think? Potentially so. Uh, yeah. Again, it's always difficult to ask me these kind of questions. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so I'm sure your listeners have a far better knowledge uh, and acquaintance with this. So I've probably just thrown myself into the masses associated. So I don't have yeah. a, such a good uh, acquaintance with it as the listeners. Of, you know, I'm not an astronomer. Um, but mm-hmm. so, so it's uh, for my benefit, some of these So do questions. you actually have card-carrying astronomers as listeners? Uh, um, well, as far as I know, we do, yes. I don't, I've, I've only um, been here for the last couple of weeks, basically. Ah. Um, but the site owner, Paul Card, mm-hmm. uh, is a NASA engineer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen our... <clears throat> web page with the other uh, guys on it and I think one's from Space Educator or that. As to our listenership you would probably need to ask uh, Paul Carr um, okay. more about that but I imagine that um, although, well, he does frame it in the sense that he says I work for NASA but these aren't the opinions of NASA, this Very is his uh, personal uh, thing basically and I'm sure that yes there are um, people that he knows at work for example who uh, listen in um, but exactly I couldn't tell you I, I imagine there are probably quite a few people like me who are just enthusiastic listeners for yeah. example and, I'll, and... I'll be very interested to hear the edited version of our conversation based on okay. that <laughs> okay fair enough <laughs> So I probably also should do an unapologetic plug associated with Stone Ape. Here. Yep, go for it. Yep. Because the reason that Tim and I are communicating is because I, aside from this artificial life thing, mm-hmm. and let's not even touch on the model rail thing. Oh, the, 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 <laughs> I was looking forward to that. <laughs> oh, if you want to, I can talk about that later. But the, I was just going to mention it in the framework of it, I, um, because it's rep, uh, early railways represents mm-hmm. an early form of computer networking mm-hmm. uh, to me. Was, was that roughly a, a good analogy to make? Yeah, think? no, I think, look, the thing that strikes me about the kinds of problems, particularly young children explore through model railways is very analogous to well even when i talk about atomic processing it's exactly the same phenomena except a road is a slightly better metaphor mm-hmm. because you have these you know mathematical corpuscles basically that are able to move between between processes as cars move between lanes and a highway so mm-hmm. but yes I, model rail provides a, a lot of interesting stuff we could talk about model rail riding 
Um, but I was, in theory... No, go, go ahead with what you were going to talk about, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so aside <clears throat> from these other things that I do, yeah. um, I, towards the tail end of recording Biota podcasts... Um, Which are very interesting, I should point out. They're really worth listening to as well. Thank you. I think if you have a kind of existing hard science audience, then the Biota podcasts are probably a good starting point. Uh, Exactly. To to the kind of miscreant stuff that I talk about. Sure. Um, sure. So at the tail end of that, a fellow called Heron Stone called in to one of the Biota podcasts, and we started chatting, and I'm I'm very receptive to kindred spirits. In fact, it's... um, it's impossible to describe this in, in politically correct terms, but uh, I'm very receptive to kindred spirits. And when I find people who I think may, I'm always looking for people that hold something, you know, Mm. this this world is kind of presented to us. And there are various eccentric humans that have wanted the world as well and Mm. found various pieces of things that I think are probably going to be interesting at some future date. And when I first conversed with Heron, I thought this guy's worth chatting with. So Heron is a variety of things, but he describes himself as being, a, well, I call him a futurist linguist. Right. So he's a futurist in terms of the fact that he can't really talk about anything outside about 50 years time in terms of his kind of projected vision, although he can talk about what's going on currently perfectly yep. fine as well. But he has this notion that English has a series of flaws which mm-hmm. make precise speaking impossible. In fact, it's the appearance of precise speaking where and no writing. precision and writing, where no yeah. precision exists Yeah, that is part of the problem. The other part of the problem he deals with, which I find fascinating and also highly <laughs> applicable to Noble Ape, is this notion that we all have an internal narrative, a voice within our heads, mm-hmm. that appears perhaps through social programming to be us. But actually, this voice inside our head that, you know, tells us stuff to do and things like that (laughs) is actually the furthest thing from us in any meaningful sense and oftentimes works against us. Now, Heron is better, better, a better person to talk about his ideas because I always misframe them in this life. But I find that a, a fascinating you know, means of exploring a wide variety of problems as well. So is he, uh, well, is that to say we're kind of uh, victims of our own cultural inputs that um, makes us um, think so that the, the language lang- is... <clears throat> the language machine is an idiom that Heron owns in terms of the way in which it's framed within his own thinking. Yeah. Um, but what I will say is that I think social input is a large part. I think also (coughs) we are given societal programming that ultimately works against us in a variety of ways too, and the language machine is part of that. I also think a series of experiences, I mean, if you, I, not formally, but through informal means, uh, have interactions with, uh, you know, animals. And -hmm. the thing that interests me, particularly associated with dogs and cats, as you see them, is Mm -hmm. that things in their early childhood, their early puppyhood, kittenhood, what have you, mm-hmm. frame exactly who they are in adult life. Yep. These things aren't necessarily linguistic. Some aspects, well, they're framed linguistically within Heron's hypothesis, mm-hmm. but they are an effect of experience as well. So irrespective of the cultural programming that happens to you, uh, if you have pneumonia when you're four, uh, you know, you may have something in, in addition to what your parents, society... And so there are things associated with the environment as well that I think yep. affect it. Yep. Um, but it's a broad it's a broad thesis that is useful for a variety of interactions. And if you quiet the voice within, mm-hmm. uh, you get... And Heron isn't as, as strong an advocate as I am associated with quietening the voice within. I, I have done a series of processes to quiet <laughs> the voice within, and I find it actually remarkably productive. Um, right, that's interesting. So, but anyway, so Heron and I talk on a weekly basis in this podcast called Stone Ape, which covers a variety of different perspectives. Most of the time, I think it's more associated with um, a rich, nut-filled dessert in mm-hmm. kind of the meal of intellectual discussion. Uh, it's not really... I mean, it, you might find some sustenance in terms of uh, carbohydrates within it, but really we are taking 
anywhere between six to a dozen topics and exploring them to a certain degree of depth. Uh, frustratingly so from some folk, um, maybe Tim can speak here on this, that um, we don't always cover everything with the same degree of depth, but we do like to return to particular topics. Mm -hmm. And I think over the past four years, I've never met Heron as well. Well, yeah, that's surprising, actually, as well. Uh, so he and I interact <clears throat> as if we are old and long friends. I know a lot about Heron's life through mm -hmm. this interaction. Um, but it serves, I think, as a means of uh, intellectual catharsis for us both. You'll mm -hmm. hear various snippets associated with Noble Ape. However, I've said more on this podcast associated with Noble Ape than I will probably say in six months' worth of Stone Ape. What I do uh, yeah. associate with my Noble Ape interactions is provide analysis and criticism to some of Heron's views. Right. But a lot of these things are actually, yeah, so it's, it's kind of multi-layer dive. It frustrates listeners in some circumstances. I would recommend fast-forwarding if you feel frustrated. Exactly. But it, it is what it is. And I think mm -hmm. in terms of, um, not necessarily, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to use the term outing, but I think I will use the term outing here. In terms mm -hmm. of outing someone who I think is a fascinating, has a fascinating perspective, mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've tried to do this with Heron. I felt that his work to date has been... Well, relatively quiet, actually. He he had a podcast that he did for a number of years that he still periodically publishes, where mm -hmm. he has a series of introductory conversations with people on Skype mm -hmm. to introduce his ideas, certainly associated with the internal narrative, and then if they're sufficiently advanced, uh, associated with the five stupidities of wild English. Oh, yes. Uh, would you be, uh, be able to explain the five stupidities yes, uh, very certainly. briefly to us? Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> Thank a you. lot of them, I think, fall into the same category. But mm -hmm. the I, well, there are five. I will just give them to you and then I'll talk more about them. Sure, sure. The word the, the verb to be, mm -hmm. absolutism, reification, and two valued logic. Two valued logic. Yes. Okay. So. We see... Let's start with two-valued logic. That's a good yeah, one. yeah well, I'm not so clear about that. Okay, so frequently, political parties are a good example of this, mm -hmm. we are told that there are two views with regards to a thing, or there are two th ways that a thing is. Uh, okay, yeah. Like and a binary kind of thing? Or? A binary kind of thing, exactly. Yeah, okay. a, a duality. Yeah. And oftentimes, this is stated as a matter of fact continuously, particularly associated with political parties. The thing that you find through this is that there's a multiplicity of solutions, which ultimately, in many cases, is multidimensional. And what you're told is, is, is two things, like true, false, or, you know, this or this, mm -hmm. is um, very rarely the case. In fact, yeah. really, that when you hear that, you should distrust what you're hearing. Absolutism. I think, I think a lot of these are similar in my own thinking, but Heron has divided them specifically, and really yeah, Heron can talk to them better. Sure. Absolutism is uh, obviously the notion of... Um, well, you see, I, I associate absolutism, reification, and the word the mm -hmm. very closely together, because they're all, they're all dealing with notions of um, surety, matters of fact... But also uh, that there is a that there is one true view. Uh, there is again, Heron would probably be better to talk here about oh, this. But yeah. re reification is the um, notion of almost taking something to an abstract form in order to um, you know identify it as 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 being something. Uh, the verb to be is slightly more curious. Um, it's just unnecessary. There's a lot of existing linguistic writing associated with how the verb to be is an artificial construct that has just been added to English over, you know, well, added to many languages, but English specifically, and is abused in just kind of vague ways that are unnecessary. Um, well, that's interesting you say that about English. For example, in Spanish, you have two ways of being, a permanent way or a temporary way. So you'd say, soy inglés, which means I am English. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you, but you could say, estoy cansado, uh, which means I'm tired. Uh, uh, so that's a temporary thing. <clears throat> they 
seems to view it in a slightly different way from the English uh, mm -hmm. way, which just uh, lumps the whole thing together, basically. So I am English and I am tired. Um, does that sort of resonate with any of that, do you think? Yeah, I think, again, it probably... I, th I think the five stupidities are really all connected with this notion of um, definition, of, yeah. you know, surety, as I'll say here. And, yes, when you hear them, you should basically bring into question what is being said. Mm. I think bringing into question what is being said just should be a given, really. Well, it should be, you know, but I think the way we, yeah. well, I suppose a lot of the way, um, well, as you said before, this uh, two-valued uh, logic thing that you'll see uh, in any uh, political run-up to an election, for example, yeah, you will see the two views, because I suppose that's um, as much as uh, most people can handle. <laughs> I think that's like, completely wrong, actually. My view oh, right, is okay. that the, the political construction that we see currently Mm. is historically based and really should be not only brought into question, but actively chipped away wherever possible. I think the notion, I mean, the circumstances, particularly in this country, although the stuff that I see in the UK isn't particularly bright and happy either, you have this swirling into a vortex that none of the population in any surveying of the population, agrees to. You have mm. kind of a single party represented by two, you know, slightly language-divided groups who are basically sure. representing exactly the same interests. Exactly, think, yeah, yeah. So within this, uh, yeah, I mean, two-added logic is a good example to kind of convince you that there is a meaningful difference between really the same point of view. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I, I, the current political systems as they exist in democracy is pretty well you know, wherever seen, at least English-speaking democracies, I just find it appalling. Um, whether or not we have any means as individuals to, you know, work against these things, I certainly think we should be able to as organised groups. And I think intellectually, the intelligentsia, particularly I find in this country currently, is so far removed from actively organising these groups to form i mean you know when i see particular supposed intellectual speaking i just shudder at <laughs> what's going right. on currently but yeah no i would say that actually when you see these things discard them and particularly associated with politicians and realize that actually uh, irrespective of what a political party says it's what that it does that is far more interesting and a lot of this posturing associated with language is just that uh, they do exactly what their masters did and unfortunately we're not their masters so, yeah. well a lot of them are from the profession of law and they're all very good with uh, language and yeah. uh, persuasion and those uh, kind of things and it is i mean what, what i meant to say earlier was that it's, it's easier for people like that to push things as if there's only two alternatives basically and um I, i'm not sure if the um the public can handle like three or four um well there are countries that have a plurality of political parties. I mean, my understanding is Germany and, to a lesser extent, France. And I was talking to a fellow from Brazil. Brazil has compulsory voting. Australia has compulsory voting as well. Oh, the right. difference in Brazil is there are actually a plurality of political parties. I mean, I wouldn't feel so bad about being forced to vote if I actually had a meaningful choice. Uh, so, but exactly. That, yeah. yeah. Are you allowed to abstain in Australia? Are you allowed to... Well, I uh, left Australia, and one of the reasons I left Australia was because of the political process. Um, oh, okay. So I've been told by other Australians that I'm not allowed to talk about that anymore. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just move on from that. But let's yeah, just yeah, say, yeah, for thinking and politically savvy people mm -hmm. living in a country where, where the problem with being forced to vote, particularly if you only have two choices, is that um, there's all this lesser of two evils nonsense that people have to... And I just find that obscene. I mean, family and friends in Australia who choose parties that I think are not only completely and utterly ineffectual, inept and corrupt, but mm. have actually... In Australia, you have this beautiful situation where one party will come into power, enact a whole lot of dubious legislation, mm -hmm. then the other party will come into power and enact similar legislation, and the party that's out of power that enacted the legislation initially says... Hold it, wait. 
this was the wrong legislation. Oh, it's horrible. It's terrible when they actually created the legislation initially. Exactly that. Exactly. I, I think it's very noticeable that a lot of governments come in and they don't reverse any of the policies of the previous administration. It's absolutely they just extraordinary. Them in many well, exactly that. Okay. They, they reinforce them and carry them on full steam ahead. It's yeah. absolutely extraordinary. But yeah. they'd. As some people think that maybe um, politicians should be legally accountable for what they say and the, uh, the, the propaganda they put out beforehand. So, um, what, what's yeah, the it's word? interesting. I mean, uh, the death penalty, I'm, <laughs> I'm relatively, in almost all circumstances, in fact, pretty well, in pretty well all circumstances, against the death penalty. Mm. But the circumstances where I actually feel a little bit warmer about the death penalty mm. relate to political corruption. I really think it should be a, the highest level of standing associated mm. with integrity should be with politicians, and it should be enforced as a society in a kind of normative way. Now, ultimately, oh. politicians dying, dying by firing squad isn't, I think, the, <laughs> Not the, the, way, to go. the way that <laughs> I would view it, but I think there needs to be a level, because the... the well, there should be some accountability, I think, if you... If you stand up before the public before an election and say, well, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and you don't do any of it at all, saying, well, I'd like to have done that, but circumstances within change, etc. Within this comes the question, I will put this out to your listenership, particularly if there are mm. a thinking folk out there. Mm -hmm. This political system that we have is based on hundreds of years of nonsense. We mm. live in a massively integrated, the fact that I can actually talk to your listenership Mm. should mean that we don't actually need the political system that we have currently, that there's mm. infrastructure and means of assessment through things like open source, mm. where um, actually the whole political infrastructure is just a facade for corruption currently. You mm. remove all of that, you get people you know, voting, interacting, uh, and you have something that is completely different. The notion that we change our politicians far more frequently than, I mean, probably so, the paint okay. is... is you know, why can't we actually interact with these policies individually in terms of, uh, you know, voting or... You, what these sorry, Tom, are. you dropped out there. Sorry. For about uh, a minute, basically. A minute, okay. <laughs> well, maybe maybe that was good. Maybe that was the FBI or the CIA. But in, <laughs> no, I, I, I was just saying that I think um, the notion that, uh, you know, we don't have means to actually enact what we as... as citizens or people within countries want is ridiculous we've got technology now that surfaces all of that the fact that facebook and twitter and all these things exist means that we could have a system which didn't require elected politicians we could just interact on issues that were important to us and the discussion would be framed by a community which is what you have the ability to do now with technology so you yes, have all this you. old stuff that's you know 200 400 years old that's been the way it's been well if you haven't watched what's been going on with technology recently, you really, you know, I, this is where I come from associated with, mm. with pol politics. But well, I think a lot of that's um, the adversity system within politics going back two, three, four hundred years uh, harkens back to a Europe where everyone was constantly at war with each other. It's like France against Prussia and, mm. you know, it's that kind of... Uh, backgrounds of belligerence that um, I suppose the current two-party system uh, still uh, has roots. Um, anyway. I don't know. I mean, last time I looked, we're constantly at war with people that we should probably be learning from. So I don't know. I mean, I think I think we're constantly at war currently. If we can't reform the current political system based on the fact that we're constantly at war with people who we've you know i mean the whole thing is ridiculous associated with that kind of analysis because we are constantly at war currently uh yes i meant more in a um well war has changed now because it's not um, two armies meeting up on a specific battlefield and duking it out or whatever it's uh, war's become much more integrated into the civilian population and it's much more complicated uh, would you uh, have any thoughts on that do you think or i think it's far simpler actually what you have yeah. is you have profiteering that arms both the enemy and the current soldiers, and you have ideologues that are paid by the profiteers to continue. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, I think it's very simple currently. I just I, it frustrates me that thinking people aren't actively, um, you know, refusing to do things in these circumstances. I think increasingly, yeah, I I can't see anything in the current circumstance that isn't represented historically, what seems to be happening currently is it's just happening at a faster and faster rate. 
and the, of course the uh, the vast amounts of uh, budget that are used up in war stop mm. us going to space to some degree. And I think uh, oh look, the amazing thing I found. I feel very uh, jaded by this, particularly living in the US. I was driving to Las Vegas, of all places, uh, earlier this year. We came up over a mountain range. You've got to appreciate California has like a two-lane highway. Las Vegas has a four-lane highway going between LA and Las Vegas. So there's actually a division, the state boundary, where the roads move to four lanes and everything becomes considerably... Because obviously all the money's flowing to Las Vegas. Yeah, sure. You come over a hill, and um, on the California side, California has solar where you can put the money, you can put electricity back on the grid, and you're actually paid for it. Mm. So yep. you come over a hill, and you, this huge, it's I think it's seven, maybe seven, ten miles long. It's called mm-hmm. Ivanpah. I would recommend your listeners check it out. I v a n p a h. It yep, okay. is the largest solar facility that I think you can probably experience currently. It is very, very moving wow. because you realize that um, this thing cost, I think, about it's either three months or six months of the war in Iraq. And wow. you realize that if this money hadn't been spent doing whatever happened in Iraq, mm. Uh, arming a whole lot of people, um, then uh, you could have, and this I think, I think it's, I'm, I'm going to get the numbers here wrong, but I think it's 900,000 homes that this solar farm can generate electricity for. It is awe inspiring. It is the vision of the future that I wanted to have. I wanted to have this basically through the 90s. And when I write, read science fiction in the early 80s, this is exactly what I wanted to see. But they still exist. You still have pockets of this wonder. Um, where, as you say, this war budget is just sucking the life out of any mm. kind of intellectual or any kind of, and I don't even use, want to use the term progressive because it's now a politically loaded term, yeah, but any, um, any notion of the future that young kids reading science fiction 20, 30 years ago had has pretty well been sucked out by the industrial military complex. What you see through this now, however, is little glimmers, and Ivan Parr, for me. In fact, the funny thing was how much it hit my wife. Mm. We pulled off either side of the road mm. and we both just looked at this thing. And when on the way back, we stopped specifically in three different locations in order to photograph it. Because wow, okay. the first thing that's happened is we've driven to Las Vegas historically. Mm. It's greened this valley that it's in. So the valley oh. used to be desert. But on one side, you have this huge solar farm. Mm-hmm. And on the other side, you just have this rich sea of green in the desert. Wow. It's it's human changing ecology for the better for once. Terraforming, which we could exactly. do on other planets. Yeah. 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 So yeah, you still see these little pockets of wonder mm-hmm. amongst all this nonsense of just total war. So, yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, another thing about California, which I found extraordinary, they spend uh, the annual budget for prisons is about twelve billion, and the annual budget for schools is about nine billion. <laughs> Absolutely yeah. extraordinary, Absolutely. Amazing. amazing. Yeah. Well, the annual budget for police here. I mm. live in the city of San Jose that has the lowest number of police per citizen in anywhere in the U.S., and it'll be dropping because they can't pay the police here. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you have this very, very strange system where. You've got these huge private prisons. I guess the private police is just the next step. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, anything else you would like to discuss, Tom? Uh, we've got about an, an hour, I've noticed, which is about the length of podcast okay. we would and put no, out. No, no, there'll be a lot of selective editing associated with views of NASA and other things. So, yeah, <laughs> maybe the industrial military complex, too. Um, let's talk a little bit about Model Rail Radio. Let's just have five yep, go for it. chatting yep, about sure. that. Yeah, so, Absolutely. I have what? listened to a few episodes, and um, just uh, to frame my opinion, I've listened to a few episodes, very interesting. I don't know nothing about model railway uh, at all. Um, but it's very kind of, uh, I don't know why, it's very compelling to listen to. <laughs> well, I had a format when I started, well, through the Biota recordings, where people would call in. Mm-hmm. And I thought that format was really interesting. Now, the community that I serve with Biota is maybe 200 people, maybe 1,000 at right. But I wanted to take that format and create something that could grow organically based on a substantial group of people. Right. And Model Rail Radio, I did a surveying of podcasts, and I thought of a, a few different topics. But the one thing that I found was that 
there were, I think, two model railroading podcasts at the time, and neither of them were really serving this organic growth model that I was interested in. So I started yeah. Model Rail Radio in 2009. It's really difficult to describe what happened over the past five odd years, but I'll, I'll, I'll say we're doing our hundredth recording in January next year. Right. I have about, I have people flying in from the East coast. I have people coming down from Oregon. I have a local community here. We're talking, I, I don't know the numbers anymore. I used to think I knew the numbers associated with unique IP address downloads and all this nonsense that people talk about with podcasts. Uh -huh. but we're talking about, you know, tens of thousands of people that listen to this thing yeah. and the growth of a community, but also very much this kind of fractured um, discussion, kind of interaction thing, uh, promoting dialogue and also solving problems, really, through right, yeah. multiple participants. Yeah. is something that I've, I mean, it, through doing what I do, I don't normally see the kind of success that I've seen through Model Rail Radio. And it's a topic where, uh, like you say, I'd like to keep it interesting enough where if people listened in for the first time having never even considered model railroading that they would get something out of it and certainly that's been the feedback i mean heron has listened to model rail radio periodically as well yep so it's a it's an example if you want to get a sense of what i'd like to do with noble ape and have historically occasionally been able to do with noble ape mm -hmm. model rail radio is really the format but if, if you're interested in more serious discussion uh, biota certainly historically works probably quite well i'm trying to restart something with a philosopher called Liz Swan currently, which is uh, similar to the Biota podcasts. Yes, I've heard uh, that you've done two podcasts mm -hmm. with her, no? And I think by the time we get to six, we'll have a name and these kind of things. I want that to kind of create itself organically. Right. right. It's been wonderful to have the chance to chat with you today, Tim. It's been very great talking to you, Tom, actually. I was, I was quite surprised. <laughs> well, I'm kind of stunned to be, to be listening to someone I normally listen to uh, in a podcast. Uh, yeah. Whatever, but... Uh, very, very, very interesting to talk to you. Um, there's plenty of other things um, we could talk about at uh, other times uh, if you uh, Certainly. want to yeah, do other. By all means, little, and if, uh, if people want to, yeah, uh, if people want to frame topics, if folks want to get in contact with me, the name of my project is Noble N O B L E Ape A P E. You can find me from nobleape.com/tom, which mm -hmm. will give all my details and some of my podcasts and this kind of information. And yeah, I, I always enjoy talking with folk. I always enjoy corresponding with folk. Sometimes not the best correspondence. Um, <laughs> my day job is that I work at Netflix. And mm. Netflix is like, a if you want to talk about all-consuming organic systems that <laughs> just keep <laughs> growing exponentially, then um, yeah, Netflix is another good metaphor. Uh, but no, I do like receiving correspondence from folks and I do like, uh, you know, discoursing on a variety of topics. So I'm yes. always... Always looking forward to receiving correspondence. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tom, for uh, having me on and uh, giving me this well, chance. Well, I, to... I was on with you, weren't I? <laughs> well, yeah. um, no, it's a kind of two-way thing, I guess, isn't Very it? Good. You know, well, we hope so. We hope so. Okay, Tom. Um, uh, thank you very much, and uh, have a great week at work at Netflix and all that. <laughs> yeah. Well, enjoy. Yeah, I'm. I'm glad to have you as a listener. Just Great, Tom. And so, well, we'll discuss um, more online, I guess, through um, our uh, ape doers and all that kind of thing. Okay, Tom. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Cheers, Tom. Bye bye. I had intended to add my own thoughts and reactions to a lot of the areas covered in the conversation with Tom Barkley, uh, but that was going to take up too much time and uh, ramble best of epic proportions was beginning to involve. So on second thoughts and for the sake of brevity and providing data-rich information and actually getting this uh, posted online, I reckon being more useful and in the collaborative spirit of Noble Ape, to quickly mention some of the other people and entities who came up in the conversation and the collaborative projects that they too have undertaken or in which they have become involved. For example, Tom had intended to present his latest version and ongoing vision of Nobly at the Biennial Contact Conference last summer, uh, but he was unable to attend at the last minute due to his wife's tonsillitis, which is obviously slightly unfortunate. 
And I think he's hoping to get to the 2016 events, uh, though I just thought a conference like this should probably be on every year. Anyway, the contact conference 2014 details are online at contactconference.com. There's a hyphen between contact and conference. And the event is described thus on their own page. Contact is a unique interdisciplinary conference which brings together some of the foremost international, social and space scientists, science fiction writers and artists to exchange ideas, stimulate new perspectives and encourage serious creative speculation about humanity's future, on-world and off-world. The list of speakers and related abstracts point to a wide community of people engaged in the search for other intelligent life in the universe and include Bruce Damer's presentation, The Genesis Engine, A New World in the Quest for Life's Origins, as well as discussions by others on the Kepler Telescope, Exoplanets and Universal Biosignatures amongst the veritable cornucopia of other presentations such as Kathleen D. Tewerpe, T-O-E-R-P-E, -E, sorry if I've mispronounced that, and her abstract is Creating a Contact Ready Earth, and Seth Shostak has a piece Looking for the Galaxy's Best and Brightest. Someone else more directly connected to Tom recently is this one who appears in his new podcast which runs every other week and currently appearing in his uh, bios alive podcast feed as well as the eight reality and stone eight sister podcasts the first three episodes are already up and really worth a listen this one has edited two books the first a collection of papers and essays called origins of mind biosemiotics 2012 blurb. The big question of how and why mindedness evolved necessitates collaborative, multidisciplinary investigation. Biosemiotics provides a new conceptual space that attracts a multitude of thinkers in the biological and cognitive sciences and humanities who recognise continuity in the biosphere from the simplest to the most complex organisms. And who are united in the project of trying to account for even the language and human consciousness in this comprehensive picture of life. Um, just a brief aside, um, human consciousness is, as far as I know, still the only consciousness we can apply to hypothesized ET intelligence, and uh, contact, if contact is ever made, it'll be of great interest and possible concern to discover what other types of consciousness exist or whether there is a universal level or type of consciousness attached to what we currently term intelligent life. Another book edited by Liz Swan is called Origins of Design and Nature, a fresh interdisciplinary look at how design emerges in complex systems, especially life. Bracket, cellular look. Bracket. Cellular Origin, Life in Extreme Habitats, and Astrobiology. I'll cover 2012. And the blurb for that goes as follows. Origins of Design in Nature is a collection of over 40 articles from prominent researchers in the life, physical and social science, medicine and the philosophy of science that all address the philosophical and scientific question of how design emerged in the natural world. The volume offers a large variety of perspectives on the design debate, including progressive accounts from artificial life, embryology, complexity, cosmology, theology, and the philosophy of biology. This book, this book is volume 23 of the series Cellular Origin, Life in Extreme Habitats, and Astrobiology. A major component of Tom Barbary's project is building communities for both people and digital content. Uh, for example, these other podcasts, there's the Eight Reality podcast and Biota.org's Artificial Life podcast, for which some of the guests include uh, Bob Mottram, to whom Tom made reference earlier, Bruce Damer, and Gerald de Jong. 
Tom also runs the Stone 8 podcast with guest and friend Heron Stone, developer of the Gendo language, as they hold forth on topics ranging from philosophy of linguistics to singularity, uh, all sorts of other stuff. And they quite often include any number of um, anecdotes and um, uh, j- just general chit chat. So. The Model Rail podcast is another community podcast set up by Tom, despite the fact he doesn't even participate in the activity himself, but nevertheless felt minded to create the project for the benefit of others anyway. In fact, I first came across our guest, Tom Barbelay, whilst searching online for good philosophy podcasts a few years back. And although this turned out to be a podcast that uh, doesn't formally address classical philosophers and so on, I was quickly drawn to the quirkiness of Stone 8 in that, uh, while you never knew what was going to pop into the conversation next, both the presenters have plenty of thoughts and opinions of a philosophical nature and often cast a suitably jaundiced eye over the affairs of what are often referred to as language monkeys. The idea that a lot of human interaction is a kind of automated set of responses to exterior criteria forever bound by the restrictions of language, vocabulary, and so on. And although the discussions can sometimes be fraught and disjointed, the underlying themes and narratives are constant. So, to wrap up this episode, if you enjoyed the podcast and would like to hear even more shows on a more frequent basis, Please continue to support the Wild Signal podcast by tuning in, spreading the word, commenting, following on Twitter, tweeting, and of course, uh, liking on Facebook, presumably. And while it's the policy no task listens to pay for access to the Wild Signal podcast, there are voluntary options through Patriots whereby you can donate, don't, whereby you can donate a small amount of money on a per episode basis. I, when they are released. If no episode is released, you don't make any donations. On the main webpage of the Wow Signal podcast, there's a merch tab that links to an online store from which Wow Signal t shirts and mugs can be purchased. You can never have too many of either, in my opinion, and the money raised from such sales gets put, that, gets put directly back into producing more podcasts on a more frequent basis. Listener comment and interactivity is always encouraged, and this can be done by a, uh, via email, leaving comments on the blog, suggesting ideas and guests to come on the podcast, um, join the Google Plus community, and even to participating in shows and co-hosting. Again, my thanks to Tom for agreeing to appear on this podcast at quite short notice, and hopefully we'll be catching up with him in the future. Thanks for listening. Signal, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. Please visit wowsignalpodcast.com for more information. All music presented on this podcast is either Creative Commons or is presented with the permission of the artist. The Wow Signal is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license.